Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Human Rights Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Kiyotaro Tsutsui. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology and uh, Program Director of Human Rights Initiative here at the University of Michigan. Um, I'll be very, this is the third and final uh, lecture for the Human Rights Initiative this semester. And we're, working, we're still working on the scheduling for the next semester's um, lectures. And uh, if you could, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make the announcement once the schedule is uh, all set. And um, if you missed the first two human rights lectures, uh, initiative lectures for this semester, uh, they're available on YouTube. So you could go there and type in human rights initiative uh, Michigan or something like that, and it'll, it'll pop up. Uh, today's talk will be introduced by uh, uh, Stuart Kirsch, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology, and he um, he was instrumental. He, he took the initiative in organizing this talk, so I asked him to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker today. Right. So, thank you, Keo, and thanks, Ken, and the International Institute for making this possible. So, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Elsa Stamatopoulou, who is director of the Indigenous Peoples Rights Program at the University of Columbia's Institute for the Study of Human Rights. Elsa spent 22 years, actually she told me today 30 years, working on human rights issues at the United Nations, and indigenous issues were part of her portfolio since 1983. And in 2003, she became the first chief of the Secretariat of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, a position she held in 2000, until 2010. And in that capacity, she promoted the integration of UN policies on indigenous peoples in the areas of development, environment, health, human rights, education, and culture. Professor Stamatapulu is the author of Cultural Rights in International Law, published in 2007, and co-editor of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 50 Years and Beyond, published in 1998. She has received much well-deserved recognition as a result of her work, including the Eleanor Roosevelt Award and many other awards from grassroots organizations. Today, she will talk to us about her work at the United Nations on Indigenous Issues. The title of her talk is The Emergen Indigenous Emergency. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stamatopoulou to the University of Michigan. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to follow uh, indigenous protocol, which is also international protocol and UN protocol. And uh, first of all, recognize the indigenous peoples of this land, the traditional owners of this territory. And since my talk is focused on the international indigenous movement, I would also recognize uh, the tremendous contribution of uh, Native Americans uh, in the creation of this movement. Let me thank very warmly this university for the invitation, in particular the International Institute's director, Professor Ken Coleman, as well as Professor Kiyo Tutsui, uh, and I would like also to express my thanks to Professor Stuart Kirsch uh, for creating such a spirit of cooperation between this university and Columbia University when we first met last June uh, at a global conference on uh, the state of indigenous studies today in academia. And at that time, we were hosted by the University of the Philippines. There are indeed many academics in this and in other countries who have been working for indigenous issues to take hold at the university as a broad cross-cutting subject of interest to a variety of disciplines, including human rights, international law, international relations, political science, development economics, sociology, anthropology, philosophy, literature, and others. Tracing what subjects are taught in academia gives us something, sometimes a good idea of their political significance in the world. People at Columbia University, for example, pride themselves in the fact that already in 1971, the uh, late professor uh, Lou Hankin taught human rights for the first time in, a, in, a, uh, in a, an American university. It took Columbia 40 years to be able to teach indigenous people's rights in 2011. So it just gives you a sense of what 
topic surface in academia. Today I would like to share uh, the story and some explanation on how indigenous people's rights have become an issue of international concern. I will also try to convey why there is an emergency about indigenous people's issues. And I will apply the angle of the international indigenous people's movement in making this presentation. Oh, you will also see my technical skills. Very good. Let's go. OK. One July afternoon in 1981, a year after I had joined the Human Rights Office at the UN in Geneva, um, the office quiet was interrupted by the sound of drums coming from the yard surrounded by the buildings of the Palais des Nations. I leaned out the window uh, and I saw a procession of Indians <clears throat> dressed in their traditional clothes marching ceremonially through the yard. I noticed that in the very front of the procession were old people supported by younger people. And the, profession, the procession and the drumming lasted for some time. It was an extraordinary sight, and many UN staff had come down to the yard to watch all this. And of course, this was my case as well. And as you can imagine, I was very intrigued and uh, was wondering why the people had, uh, were there and who they were going to see. And I found out, to my delight, that they were going to see a colleague of mine, uh, Augusto Williamson Diaz, who was a, Gu a Guatemalan polit political refugee those days and who was the first person at the UN to work on indigenous people's uh, rights, and who then became my mentor. He's now more than 90 years old, and he lives in Guatemala. At the beginning of every session of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which is the body I serviced until 2010, we recognize the indigenous peoples of the land, the Onondaga people, who are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, and here you saw the last picture, where you saw a woman holding a passport. This is a Haudenosaunee passport. There she is. Uh, and this is the passport that people were using and which was recognized in, uh, by Switzerland in, um, uh, in people coming into Switzerland to the United Nations to those meetings. Uh, so. The famous ancestor of the Haudenosaunee, Chief Descahe, is a very significant figure from an international perspective. Let me spend a few minutes on this story. In 1923, Cayuga Chief Descahe traveled to Geneva as the representative of the six nations of the Iroquois to the League of Nations, which is the precursor of the United Nations to plead the cause of his people. He waited one year to be received, and he was not received. But in the meantime, he made many friends in Geneva. And he returned in the United States. And a few months before his death in 20, 1925, he made a speech by radio in Rochester, New York. This is an excerpt of the speech. Quote, this is the story of the Mohawks, the story of the Oneidas of the Cayugas of the Onondagas, the Senecas, and the Tuscaroras. They are the Iroquois. Tell it to those who have not been listening. Maybe I will be stopped from telling it. But if I am prevented from telling it over, as I hope I do, the story will not be lost. I have already told it to thousands of listeners in Europe. It has gone into the records where your children can find it, when I may be dead or be in jail for daring to tell the truth. I have told this story in Switzerland. They have free speech in little Switzerland. Mm -hmm. One can tell the truth over there in public, even if it is uncomfortable for some great people. I am the speaker of the Six Nations, the oldest League of Nations now existing. It is a league which is still alive and intense as best it can to defend the rights of the Iroquois to live under their own laws in their own little countries now left to them, to worship the Great Spirit in their own way, and to enjoy the rights which are as surely theirs as the white man's rights are his own." Unquote. A similar journey, strangely enough, took place a year later to Geneva by a Maori religious and political leader. Ratana was his name. Ratana decided to protest the breaking of the Treaty of Waitangi, 
concluded by the British Crown with the Maori in New Zealand in 1840 that gave Maori ownership of their lands and first traveled, Ratana traveled to London with a large delegation to petition King George, but he was denied access. So he then sent part of his delegation to Geneva to the League of Nations and arrived there later himself in 25, but was also denied access. Why am I giving this introduction? To show that the history of indigenous peoples knocking at the doors of the institutions of states, like the League of Nations, is old. Indigenous peoples' sense of themselves as sovereign nations in parity with other nations of the world has always been very strong. The fact that states, the colonizing powers, concluded treaties with many indigenous peoples is a testimony that indigenous peoples were viewed as sovereign, not only by themselves, but also by those who actually invented international law, the states, that is. Today, I would like to briefly address how and why indigenous peoples' issues became internationalized after the Second World War. How did the characteristics of this internationalization change over time in the past 60 years, and why? What have been the main issues? What circumstances gave rise to the international indigenous people's rights movement? And what was the role of the UN in this process? And how has the dynamic interface between indigenous peoples and the UN impacted on today's politics on this issue? and other issues. But first, let me say a few words about what are the issues and who are the indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are estimated to number about 370 million people around the world uh, living in about 90 countries. It's also estimated that they represent as many as 5,000 different indigenous cultures, and the indigenous peoples of the world therefore account for most of the world's cultural diversity, even though they constitute a numerical minority. The situation of indigenous peoples in many parts of the world continues to be critical. It's usually estimated that there are, there are between six and 7,000 oral languages uh, spoken in the world today, and a great majority of them, more than 5,000, are spoken by indigenous peoples and roughly 90% of all existing languages may become extinct within the next 100 years. So we understand what percentage this represents in terms of indigenous languages and cultures. Indigenous peoples are very high in the, uh, in the, amongst the poorest. In fact, uh, they, although they are 5% of the world's population, they are estimated, according to the World Bank, to represent about 15% of the world's extremely poor. Even in developed countries, they consistently lag behind the non-indigenous population in terms of most indicators of well-being. They live shorter lives, have poorer health care and education, and endure higher um, unemployment rates. An Aboriginal child born in Australia today can expect to die almost 20 years earlier than his non-native compatriot. According to the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice study on violence against women, more than one in three American Indian and Alaska Native women uh, will be raped during her lifetime. A comparable figure for the U.S. as a whole is less than one in five. The weapon of rape and sexual humiliation is also turned against indigenous women for the ethnic cleansing and demoralization of indigenous communities. Uh, and the list goes on. One of the most serious shortcomings in human rights protection in recent years is, in fact, the trend in states' action to penalize and criminalize social protest activities and legitimate demands made by indigenous organizations and movements in defense of their rights. And last but not least, the endless hunger of the dominant development paradigm for natural resources leads to continuous land grabbing and exploitation of indigenous lands by corporations, especially extractive industries, thus depriving indigenous communities of their basic livelihood and leading to further violence and marginalization. Now, the UN has no definition of indigenous peoples, and the prevailing view today is that we don't need one in order to 
uh, recognize and protect indigenous rights. In order to de demystify what I just said, I will say that we also don't have definitions for the word peoples, the word, minor word minorities, the word family, even the word child or terrorism. And yet a lot of action is taken around the world on these uh, areas. Uh, what I will tell you is give you a brief overview of some of the existing um, elements, attempts to outline some characteristics of indigenous peoples. Uh, the monumental study of the UN uh, of the 70s uh, called UN Study on the Problem of Discrimination uh, Against Indigenous Populations uh, 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 puts forward the following working definition. Indigenous communities, peoples, and nations are those which, having a historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territories, consider themselves distinct from other sectors of the societies now prevailing in those territories or parts of them. They form at present non-dominant sectors of society. So this is the element of marginalization, non-dominant sectors of society, and are determined to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations their ancestral territories and their ethnic identity. They are determined, meaning the subjective element. There is a political element of the group determined to continue itself. Uh, in fu for future generations in accordance with their own cultural patterns, social institutions, and legal systems. But as I said, this is, these are just some elements. There is no formal definition in international law. Self-identification as indigenous or tribal is considered as a fundamental criterion. And this is the practice followed in the UN. In other words, the UN doesn't go around saying you are indigenous, you are not. But people who self groups that self-identify are accredited to the UN meetings on indigenous issues. There is a distinction of the concept of indigenous peoples from the concept of minorities in international affairs and international law due to the different historical origins of the two terms, which have also resulted in different international legal normative regimes. In addition, indigenous peoples are majorities in some countries, or in any case, are majorities in the areas where they live. I will distinguish, uh, 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 my, uh, d discriminate between two main eras uh, in terms of development of this issue internationally. The first era is from 1945, creation after the uh, Second World War, creation of the UN, 45 to 93. And this era is, is characterized by the establishment of the first international institutional foundations. In 1957, 1957, the International Labor Organization did a study on forced labor of native populations. In, in other words, it's through forced labor and slavery issues that this became first came to the international uh, uh, fore. Uh, and the ILO created uh, Convention 107, which was later criticized as assimilationist by the indigenous movement. In 72, uh, we have the launch by a major human rights body called Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities of a study of the problem of discrimination against indigenous populations. This study began at, began at a time that the indigenous movement started slowly appearing. It was a time of an increased involvement of Native Americans with the civil rights movement of this country. And this gave birth to the American Indian movement in the United States of America. And this uh, framing in human rights terms of the indigenous movement itself became a major characteristic of the movement. We will, uh, in a minute, we will say why. In the 1970s, we start witnessing the establishment of uh, uh, the, 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 the proclamation in, in the public sphere of movements, 
in different parts of the world, not just in the United States, Canada and the Americas in general, Central America, South America, important in this, immediately they started. Also the, in the Arctic they started and happening, and also in the Pacific, uh, in Hawaii, in, uh, in New Zealand, in Australia, and also in uh, a number of uh, Asian countries. And in 1977, we see the first NGO conference on indigenous peoples held in the United Nations facilities in Geneva. That's where the photographs are from that I showed you. This is 1977 in Geneva. Um, now, the study normally at the UN is a study of um, among states, of comparative uh, international law among states, and it would take normally and still take such an international study uh, done by the UN, take something between three and five years to do. However, what it was realized uh, very early on by Augusto Williamson Diaz was that if since the movement was just being born at that point, if we just w did an, an intergovernmental study, it would not reflect realities. Therefore, uh, uh, the, the methodology of the study changed tremendously and became, and Augusto Williamson Diaz made it into a participatory study. And he, he ordered the creation of 37 monographs about 37 different situations around the world. This gave the opportunity and the time to the, to the movement that was being created to give its input and, and become, therefore, a real study, a study that really reflected you know, reality instead of just being you know, a governmental positions uh, of different uh, countries that would have bothered to respond to the UN's questionnaire. So uh, this study became, therefore, the longest, the one that took the longest to, to prepare and the most voluminous study. One can find it today on the website of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And at the end of this study, uh, uh, of the creation of this study, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations was created in 1982, which is the first indigenous-specific um, uh, uh, group mechanism at the United Nations. Later on in 1989, the ILO was obliged again, through, uh, thanks to the pressure of the indigenous movement, to update its, uh, its uh, treaty on indigenous and created uh, Convention 169, uh, which was no longer an assimilationist treaty. Uh, in 1993, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations completes the draft declaration on the, on the rights of indigenous peoples. It is a draft that is held in high esteem by indigenous peoples because they have now participated. They have participated in unprecedented ways. The UN in 83 already, this is when I started getting involved in this, managed to allow completely outside any procedure accepted uh, until then by the United Nations to allow and open the door to representatives of, commu of indigenous communities, indigenous nations, indigenous organizations, without, in other words, those having the formal uh, status of non-governmental organization at the United Nations, which normally goes through a vetting process and so on. In other words, the UN allowed these people to come directly and speak about their situation. 93 again was significant because it became the international year of the world's indigenous people and Rigoberta Menchu uh, from Guatemala became the UN's goodwill ambassador for the, for the international year. And also in 93, the World Conference on Human Rights uh, said that there should be a permanent forum on indigenous issues at the UN. So this closes a, a time, you know, of institutional, putting the first institutional foundations. Then we come to 90, from 93 to date, uh, we have here uh, the creation of a monitoring of human rights situation of indigenous peoples by the creation of a specific mechanism called Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, whose job is to check in the field, to receive complaints, check in the field through country visits and otherwise how uh, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples are um, uh, respected or not on the ground. Uh, and to report to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council. Uh, 
the first uh, rapporteur was uh, Rodolfo Stavenhagen, an anth a famous anthropologist from Mexico. And the second one right now is Jim Anaya, a Native American himself, whose mandate is running out uh, next year. Then uh, the UN established uh, in uh, the year 2000 the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. I will tell you in a minute a bit more about it. Uh, in this time, it managed, after 25 years of negotiation of the draft declaration, to adopt, finally, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. And then st the UN started, thanks to the pressure again of the movement, to make more operational its standards on the ground. So in 2008, we have the UN's development group. It's a group that puts together everybody who works on development issues at the United Nations. That group adopted a set of guidelines on indigenous people's issues that are to guide operational activities on the ground and that are based on the declaration itself. Let me come to the permanent forum. The permanent forum is a high-level body that creates policies for inclusion and for changing paradigms so that there will be uh, you know, more justice towards the indigenous peoples. Its composition is, again, unprecedented. I call these unprecedented things, as you see. I, use, I like you to use this word. I call it uh, corrective exceptionalism of the UN, because back in the minds of the of the of states, there is something, uh, you know. Why would they give uh, exception, such exception, you know, to indigenous peoples? Because, well, there is maybe a, the guilt of nations. Somebody wrote a book about the guilt of nations. Uh, so um, this has an unprecedented uh, membership. Eight uh, members of the permanent forum are indigenous, nominated by indigenous peoples, and eight are nominated by states. And they sit together at a level of parity around the table, and they are uh, uh, um, um, to make recommend policy recommendations on six broad areas, environment, development, health, education, culture, and human rights, basically life, everything. You know, they can make policy recommendations on all these, uh, in all these areas. Uh, indigenous peoples uh, participate according to the same rules, practical rules that I mentioned earlier, according to the working group's rule. So there is this direct participation again that I mentioned. Um, and something I want to underline is that uh, it was felt by states, but also by indigenous peoples, that by adding all these other areas in the mandate of the forum, in other words, not just human rights, uh, by adding all these other areas, perhaps some more practical results could be achieved in terms of, uh, you know, moving resources to, this, to these unprivileged parts of our societies. And I say this because the human rights area is always extremely um, politicized. Uh, in international affairs. And uh, sometimes debates cannot take a practical, uh, you know, tinge to them to, to create practical results. And this is why, uh, you know, both indigenous and states uh, felt that. Of course, states were trying also to get away a little bit from the uh, human rights agenda, which is a bit bothersome or quite a bit bothersome to them. Um, Today, therefore, after uh, in 82, we had 15 NGO people attending the Working Group on Indigenous Populations. And today, we have 1,500 to 2,000 Indigenous representatives who attend the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples, in addition to about 70 countries and 35 intergovernmental organizations. Uh, and lastly, following some strong advocacy by indigenous peoples, the Human Rights Council also established uh, the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples to advise, to, to provide to the council research-based advice. So the, the, the expert mechanism conducts studies. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has made um, uh, how can I say, has created tremendous inroads in, um, I would say, both uh, political science and um, 
uh, international uh, legal uh, doctrine. There were uh, a, a number of core issues uh, that um, uh, created both this, uh, you know, exceptional uh, spirit of this declaration, but also the difficulties in drafting it. Uh, the first issue is self-determination. The second issue is traditional lands, territories, and resources. And the third is indigenous people's visions of development. So when the, the, uh, uh, the, the UN adopted this declaration in 2007, in fact, what we were marking is the end of 25 years of negotiations, be not among states, which are the components of the UN, but in reality, it was a negotiation between states and indigenous peoples with the UN being a, a facilitator of this. That's how we have to see it. So that's another you know, exceptional uh, circumstance that, uh, you know, surrounds indigenous issues internationally. So, um, and the adoption of this declaration had political, legal, moral, and symbolic implications. The pillars of the declaration, first of all, self-determination, nine preambular and 15 operative paragraphs deal with consultation, partnership, and participation of indigenous peoples in a democratic polity. So the text recognizes that indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination, and by that right, they can freely determine their political status and pursue their economic, cultural, and social development. They have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions while retaining their rights to participate fully, if they so choose, in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. Second, land rights and natural and resource rights. Declaration recognizes subsistence rights and rights to lands, territories, and resources, and recognizes that peoples de deprived of their means of subsistence and development are entitled to just and fair redress. And third, cultural rights. 17 of the 46 articles deal with cultural rights and the protection and development of indigenous cultures. Essentially, although this might sound, uh, as I say it in a soundbite, uh, very ambitious, the declaration essentially outlaws discrimination against indigenous peoples and promotes their full and effective participation in all matters that concern them. I should also add that the declaration is the boldest and most formal recognition of ethnicity in international affairs as of now. There is no comparison between the legal regime uh, surrounding indigenous peoples and that surrounding minorities or other you know, ethnic matters. So this is the boldest recognition of, eth of ethnicity in international affairs. I would like to make a comment uh, about the right to self-determination because this is, uh, you know, something of, uh, uh, of a tremendous, um, how can I say, concern. Uh, it was a, a matter of tremendous concern during the negotiations, and it's, it's still uh, of some concern uh, to some uh, governments. So the UN Charter in Article 1 describes the purposes of the organization, and in paragraph 2, of that article, of Article 1, it says that its aim is to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. But even before the UN Charter spoke of the concept of self-determination, indigenous nations were and saw themselves as sovereign and self-determining. In fact, even the colonizing powers, colonizing states saw that as well. And while trying to conquer the indigenous peoples, when they couldn't do that, they were establishing government-to-government -government relations with them. This is a very important term, government-to-government -government relations. This is a very important, valid term today that matters a lot in indigenous uh, political affairs. 
in the UN era, the development, uh, the, uh, the UN era signaled the time of decolonization soon after the organization's creation. And self-determination and sovereignty became concepts much cherished by the newly independent countries. However, it's interesting to remember that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 48 did not contain the right to, to self-determination. In 48, the world was not yet ready to recognize that right. But the dynamic nature of human rights international law allows for a continuing development and refinement of concepts. As international relations evolve, it becomes possible through often robust debates to establish new international human rights standards. As it became thus, as it became possible in 66 to proclaim the right to self-determination as common article one to the two big human rights covenants, the covenant on civil and political rights and the covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. And that, that common article one states, all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. What is interesting is that the 66 covenants, the two covenants, added a paragraph that's very important for indigenous peoples. It's about natural resources and subsistence rights. Some people forget that. You know, they think that all this was an invention of the indigenous. But in 66, you have that in the covenants. So uh, there is language there in paragraph two of article one about that. So the most, what I want to say is that the most comprehensive discussion on self-determination after the 50s and early 60s, when it was the time of decolonization, happened when the dra draft declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples were, was, uh, was being made. So, so if, if anybody is interested in uh, how the concept has developed, that's where you will see the stated positions of, of countries uh, with all their nuances. Uh, apropos, it was apropos of the declaration, the debates on the declaration. And so the declaration itself in Article 3 uses the same words on the right to self-determination as common Article 1 of the two covenants. It says indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Last but not least, a clarification was added last minute the 25th year of negotiations in 2007 summer before its adoption. It was about territorial integrity. It was added in the last article of the declaration. It says, nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, people, group, or, or person any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the charter of the UN or construed as authorizing or encouraging any action which would, would dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. This was not indispensable to be added because the charter of the UN includes it, but it was indispensable in the negotiations but for African countries which had uh, not participated until the last minute in the debates because they thought that indigenous issues did not concern them. They came late and they, because they, the issue of self-determination is very important for them. Uh, they came in and they said, no, no, we want this added. And then once the indigenous uh, diplomats uh, agreed or most of them agreed to add this because in any case it was understood. Uh, then uh, the, all the African countries came behind and voted in, in favor of the declaration. In terms of territories, what is particular about the relationship of indigenous peoples with their ancestral lands and territories? It is recognized that indigenous peoples have a special relationship with the land. It's spiritual, cultural, and material as a relationship. And their cultural and material survival generally depends on them having access to their traditional lands. And this relationship is not just one of private property and ownership, but one of collective ownership of the lands by the community. 
the declaration prohibits forced displacement, displacement from indigenous people's traditional lands. It recognizes the right for them to maintain their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used lands, territories, waters, and coastal areas, and other resources. It also boldly recognizes the rights to lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired, the right to redre redress, restitution, compensation for lands confiscated, taken, occupied, used, damaged, without their free, prior, and informed consent. At least nine articles of the Declaration deal with land. Some of the issues that the indigenous peoples have had to face regarding their lands historically and also today, whether through colonization, occupation, or, or sheer discrimination, indigenous peoples have been forcibly dispossessed of their lands, uh, often displaced and turned into refugees, sometimes among the poorest uh, city dwellers. And because most of the still unexplored uh, natural resources of this earth are on indigenous people's lands called remote by us uh, who are in the centers. Uh, well, this is the big challenge today, uh, the big challenge of uh, the, especially the extractive industry going into those lands. But also conservancy parks o o often open the road to land grabbing. Lastly, private privatization of indigenous lands and the cutting of those lands into individual parcels also is a way through which countries, uh, governments, you know, states um, undermine the right to land for indigenous peoples. But what are the most difficult, some of the most difficult questions that a well-meaning government would face? I like to think of a well-meaning government, to sit in a vacuum and think about such a government. In many countries, or in most countries, natural resources belong to the state. How can the state reconcile the land rights of indigenous peoples with this? If we assume that a well-meaning government that wishes to improve the well-being of the whole population wants to exploit the traditional lands of indigenous peoples, is this legitimate? Can indigenous peoples veto the use of the natural resources on their lands? What are the conditions for the state to deal with indigenous peoples concerning their traditional lands and resources? What does it mean to negotiate resources in the face of historical injustice? What are access and benefit sharing regimes? I will not answer all that, okay? These issues bring us to the indigenous uh, peoples questioning the development agenda, the dominant paradigm. Thanks to the visibility of indigenous peoples today, we speak about their visions of development, a development with culture and identity, we say, including the Millennium Development Goals, which is, you know, how uh, the epitome of uh, the international development agenda is called Millennium Development Goals. The intergovernmental system is challenged to reconcile with alternative concepts of development, or rather, as indigenous peoples prefer to call it, the concept of well-being or vivir bien. What is development? Who decides? Development for whom and at what cost? What are indicators of poverty and well-being for indigenous peoples? What does it mean to promote development with culture in an era of globalization? So the whole question of what is development and who defines it is the subject of political, philosophical debates. And I must say that uh, in the United Nations, the only alternative voice putting forward some different ideas about this that is tolerated or uh, in a certain way is the voice of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and of Indigenous Peoples. There is no other paradigm that is being put forward out there in, the, in those international debates, I must, I must admit. So the Permanent Forum itself has done a critique of the Millennium Development Goals and what, I they would, uh, what it would mean, they would, their implementation would mean for indigenous peoples. For example, if you implement uh, the basic edu uh, elementary education for all by the year 2015, which is MDG number two, if you do this uh, without sensitivity, to indigenous peoples' cultures, basically you can uh, you are speaking about uh, very fast assimilation 
putting assimilation on fast track if you, you don't do this with a certain sensitivity. Are there good examples? Are there some good developments after what all this? Well, here you have the permanent forum. Does it come out? Yes. That had been um, invited by the government of China to hold a processional meeting in Beijing. This is uh, in 2010, we had the opening of the forum where uh, it was standing room only, as you can see. The special theme was indigenous women. And we had a great granddaughter of Chief Tescahe, who also shared some words with us. These are indigenous uh, elders in Bolivia at the ceremonial room of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs offering a welcome to the permanent forum. This room had not seen indigenous people since uh, before President Morales took over. I mean, this is the fact that they were doing an opening ceremony in that particular room had a political significance, obviously. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it's when, in 2010, New Zealand, the minister of uh, Maori affairs, uh, came to announced the support by New Zealand for the declaration. And uh, there was, as you see, a ceremonial welcome by Maoris. But what was moving about it is that you had Maoris and non-Maoris that came to the General Assembly, New Zealanders, who came to the assembly, including the ambassador, the white-haired gentleman there, who were singing uh, that uh, ceremonial introduction uh, to the uh, to us to introduce the, the acceptance. You know. um, uh, following negotiations between Denmark and the Home Rule government of Greenland, a referendum was held in Greenland in November 2008 and decided on the autonomous status of Greenland uh, starting 21st of June 2009. Through court cases, we have many examples in this country and in other countries where uh, cases are won and land rights are uh, given back, uh, lands are given back to indigenous peoples uh, based on the concepts of the declaration. The Maori in New Zealand have managed to obtain control of 40% of the fisheries in that country. Um, and in Latin America, there have been major legislative and constitutional changes recognizing the existence of indigenous peoples and the nature of states as multicultural, such as in Ecuador, Guatemala, Bolivia. Uh, indigenous languages are increasingly recognized even constitutionally. And in Latin America, 17 countries now promote bilingual intercultural education. In a number of developed countries, you have had the issuance of formal apologies. Uh, this was the case in Australia in 2008, uh, when the first day in Parliament saw the declaration of a formal apology to the lost generation of Aboriginal peoples due to the boarding schools policies. The same year this happened in Canada, and again regarding boarding schools, and again in 2008, uh, Japan recognized the Ainu as the indigenous people of uh, the country. In 2010, El Salvador uh, similarly uh, acknowledged uh, the existence of the indigenous peoples and officially recognized them. Taking stock of developments such as these, I ask three final questions. What has been the role of human rights discourses in the internationalization of indigenous peoples' issues? Two, what has promoted the creation of an international indigenous identity and the transformation of local movements into a global one? And three, how did the dynamics between indigenous peoples and states change over time? It's important to underline that it is through the human rights angle that indigenous issues received international attention, because human rights bring out a political edge that catches states, states' attention and annoying sensitivity because of the critique of their practices that human rights uh, involves. 
that other approaches don't necessarily bring. For example, the social approach does not bring that. Even economic approach does not bring that. The human rights angle brings that. In fact, the women's movement learned a lot from the, human, from the indigenous movement and actually put the spin of human rights uh, when in 1993 at the World Commission of Human Rights, the women's movement came uh, with a big slogan, women's rights are human rights. The internationalization of the indigenous movement saw the birth of a new awareness among indigenous peoples and their communities, an awareness of their quote unquote indigeneity as part of an identity and a category at the international level. We have seen, for instance, that in Latin America, some social justice movements of peasants, los campesinos, originally included both indigenous and non-indigenous people. After the 70s, however, more and more indigenous peoples established distinct political organizations inspired by the international indigenous movement and the empowerment that this brought. For indigenous peoples, the UN became both a site of channeling their complaints of human rights violations and also for articulating their aspirations for the future uh, for, as indigenous peoples. The UN also became a public space through which a global indigenous people's identity was born, especially as indigenous peoples from all continents were joining this movement. Today we see that without exaggeration, indigenous peoples link up as a circle of friends via email on a daily basis to comment on recent developments, to organize and strategize. Let me also say that since we are at the university, that academia also played a role, continues to play, but especially at the beginning. And two disciplines, actually, uh, in particular, accompanied the movement. It was anthropology and international law, and more specifically, international uh, uh, human rights uh, law under international law that accompanied. And for this reason, we accredit academics and students also uh, to the permanent forum uh, when they come to the UN. What was the change over time? First of all, while stories, there were many stories of political and cultural resistance of indigenous peoples at the local level to colonialism, domination, and exploitation. But they didn't always find resonance at the international level, in particular at the UN. Because at the sec in the era of the second, after the Second World War, states were very suspicious of things ethnic and things that had to do with minorities. In fact, the UN's work on minorities was actually marginalized uh, by the states to a very large extent. But what made it that indigenous issues managed to surface is that there an, in an international movement was created. And there was never an international movement of minorities. And there are still there is not such a movement. That's the difference. The main change of positions have been this. At the beginning, states showed a humanitarian feeling to the indigenous because they saw them as vanishing cultures. So they allowed this corrective exceptionalism, which, which I mentioned before, <laughs> because they saw they pitied them, if I can use this word. But this rather sooner rather than later ended. Indigenous peoples, as the, their movement was, uh, you know, took hold, as the declaration's first draft was created, it became a different ball game, a different political game. And by now, of course, states do not see indigenous peoples in this light, but sometimes, actually, they fear the indigenous movement. In conclusion, where are we now? The vigorous and dynamic interface between indigenous peoples' movements and the UN has produced at least three things. One, an awareness of indigenous people's concerns and indigenous people's human rights. Two, a recognition of indigenous people's invaluable contribution to humanity's cultural diversity and heritage, not least through their traditional knowledge. And third, an awareness of the need to address the problems of indigenous peoples through specific policies, laws, and budgets with the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples themselves. The greatest challenge today is the war launched 
by extractive industries on lands and territories of indigenous peoples. And I think uh, the question is whether states and the non-indigenous civil society will realize that this emergency concerns us all and it's not just about them. And this is today's most pressing question in my mind. It's a moral question, an existential question, and a human rights question. Thank you.